This talk's called Designing HTTP Interfaces in RESTful Web Services. Who has heard of REST? <sighs> um, keep your hands up. Who has heard of REST? Who could define what hypermedia is to me? So you haven't heard of REST. That's good. So we can sort that. Um, my name is David. Um, you can also spell it like this. I'm from uh, Germany, um, from Munich, actually, where Oktoberfest just ended, which, of course, is a sad thing because means not so much B anymore. Um, I work there as a founder of a company called BitExtender. We do web development consulting, lots of architectural stuff, REST, and in general, APIs, service-oriented architectures, lots of Hadoop lately with PHP. And I'm also the lead developer of the Agave framework. Uh, this is coincidence. So I usually wouldn't wear orange shoes with red T-shirts, but <clears throat> hey. <laughs> Um, so that was an accident. Uh, this is my Twitter nickname if you'd like to bash or praise my talk whilst I'm speaking. And um, since this is normally a one hour talk and we only have 45 minutes, you're, you're not going to get to ask questions, sorry. Uh, I have to rush this a little bit and cut corners maybe. But if you have any question whilst I'm speaking, just raise your hand. You don't have to wait till the end, okay? So because it's usually easier for the others also to follow along with your question. If the slide's still up there and I just discussed whatever you have a question about. So in the olden days, um, before the REST stuff was even well known, right? Because it's an, it's an insane buzzword. REST is like the cloud today. I, like last week, I learned that Hotmail is cloud email, apparently. Which is, I mean, it's been around like since 1995, maybe, and it was never the cloud until some marketing douchebags came up with, Ugh. so it's the same problem with REST, right? So, because we had URLs like these, okay? And then with the dot com craze, et cetera, finally people figured out, hey, we can make money on the internet. So, um, then all of a sudden, on the doorsteps of programmers, uh, the SEO experts showed up and said, nein, you can't have URLs like this. At least the German ones yelled like this. So we had to, <clears throat> we had to optimize the URLs a little bit, and uh, like this, okay, which made no sense. And then things got out of control because nobody had a clue, and because all these RESTful frameworks, or not RESTful frameworks, just the web frameworks, had these routings that made people very creative. And from the latest hamburger videos, it quickly spiraled out of control um, into URLs like these. And um, that is a problem. And at the same time, um, during the dot, like after the dot-com phase, we had this rise in web services, right? Because, <laughs> what? <laughs> so uh, we had web services like this, right? This is so, the problem is I need to actually, this is a bit, is this movable? I, I won't try. So um, yeah, I have a laser, this is awesome. I like, so I'm still, if someone ever finds you know my Twitter nickname, right? Right. So if you if you in any shop see a shark-shaped laser pointer, that would be fantastic because it's a shark with laser beams attached to its head. <laughs> <laughs> but so I have to do with the, this with this thing. Uh, so we have a soap envelope, right? And here is the operation that we want to call, like get product, and we pass an ID in, and it returns us something. And it's a get product response, and this is an object, and somewhere is an XML schema defining, hey, what are the object types? What, how do you marshal them from native types to XML and back? And also, then uh, you'd have angry email exchanges between client and server uh, programmers figuring out what method to call when in what sequence. Because just having the schema doesn't tell you how to use the API. Like, oh, why? Why do I need to call login first? You know, like some, some Java framework, like if you had a JBoss seam powered SOAP web service, then you'd have to, it would actually give you, you'd, you'd log in and it gives you a cookie back on the HTTP level and you have to pass the cookie along all the time, a J conversation ID cookie. Otherwise, everything would just break, which is not even in SOAP, right? It was on the, on the transport layer because SOAP is supposed to be transport agnostic. You could do this over SMTP, which is actually in the specification. Amazon at some point did all the, all the website building on the front end uh, through SOAP calls to a middleware. They called, like for every time you call a product page, 20 calls went to a middleware with SOAP not XML, but the custom serialization format that was more efficient over sockets that were persistent, not HTTP, to save on round trips. But yeah, so, but it was a mess because, I mean, you had maybe a schema, but how do you actually use the thing? And, uh, and then maybe you had some rudimentary um, 
error handling that's actually used the protocol level. So in the case the product doesn't exist, you get a 500 internal server error. But then you actually need to know, ah, it's a fault. And uh, But it, all this is well defined. And every time, the, I mean, how many of you have used SERP services? How often did the server provider change something and your client broke? <laughs> right? That happens all the fucking time. It's annoying. So. That, then people said, oh, that sucks. Like, we need something better, OK? Then, then they built APIs like this. Like, this is joined in. This is like a community portal thing. I'm not, it's, a nice, it's a nice little website, open source effort. But the API stinks, right? And they know they're building a new one, which is going to be awesome. Uh, and then you had this, like uh, you have an auth, and then you have an action type get detail. And, but on the, on the HTTP level, you're posting to something. Like you're fetching a resource, but you're making a post. So in any intermediary proxy can't even cache it because it thinks, oh, it's a post, so how am I supposed to know that this is a cacheable response, right? And a proxy in between, a squid or a reverse proxy, would have to understand this protocol interpret the body, see it's a get detail, everything that starts with get is a safe method, and cache it. That doesn't work, right? So that's the problem. It, it's always a post. It doesn't even use HTTP authentication, which is also a bit questionable. And um, the operation information is uh, enclosed in the request, so nothing is cacheable. And everything goes through one endpoint. And there's a guy called Richardson... I don't know his first name, so let's call him Bob. Bob Richardson. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he, he, so he did, you guys know Martin Fowler, right, who wrote the Patents of Enterprise Application Architecture? So um, Fowler once linked to, to Richardson, who tried to describe restful levels, like how restful is an application. And that is level zero. That's plain old XML over the wire. Right? And um, we could improve this a little bit in case of the joined in API, for instance, to say every talk has its own URI. Okay? And that would be level one in Richardson's maturity model. And please don't use these because they suck always. Okay? So these are a bag of hurts. There will always be lots of trouble. Avoid that. Then, a few years back, there was a guy, Roy Fielding, and he said, hey, there's this REST thing which was quickly became popular because everyone could say, I have a REST API now, when in fact they didn't. So um, we, have to, we have to check what REST even means. So the, it's an abbreviation for representational state transfer. And it's defined in his thesis. And that is a document, it's a work describing network-based architectures. It actually has nothing to do with HTTP per se. The fact that REST works so well of HTTP is just because, well, HTTP, you know, checks all the boxes. So um, he was talking about distributed networking applications and how to make them truly interoperable and evolvable and durable. And that is what REST is about. So his thesis defines a bunch of constraints. It needs to be a client-server interaction because obviously it's a networking application, right? Um, it needs to be stateless, so the server doesn't maintain client state. It doesn't mean that the client can't create a resource representing some sort of state it needs to remember, like a shopping cart, right? But the shopping cart shouldn't be implicit through some sort of session cookie, but there should be a URL for every shopping cart that you can address. Um, a layered system, so you can have any number of intermediaries, whether the request goes directly from the client to the server, or whether it passes through a client proxy on the on the client side, and the reverse proxy on the server side should not matter. And that adds cacheability, of course, right? This, the cacheability is only possible through the layered system. Um, code on demand is the optional part. That's the best explanation of this is HTML and JavaScript, which is interpreted by a browser and run to enhance the experience. We can ignore this because it's theoretical. And the uniform interface. And that is the secret ingredient, right? This is what REST is really about. So. Um, <laughs> The simple explanation of that is that you have a URL identifying a resource. And then um, these resources, through the HTTP spec, actually, this is not in the REST thesis, um, have, have an implicit hierarchy. So if you have a slash product slash and you post to it, you know that it's a subordinate resource created in the product collection. That is something the HTTP spec mandates. Um, you have so-called methods. HTTP calls them verbs, post, put, get, delete 
to perform operations on resources, and um, the operation is not part of a URL. So you don't have slash get detail. You have slash delete and slash edit on the web, so you can display the form, but that's a, an, an edge case. That's totally fine, okay? Um, so you have, and then you have, an, uh, sorry, let's, let's discuss this first quick. So you have, an, the operation is implicit, which means um, it's implicit through the verb used. It's not represented in the URL, which means you have a get slash, get slash laptop, and that gets the laptop. And you have a delete slash laptop that throws it on the ground, right? And you have a put slash laptop that upgrades it in some way, which is, okay, that's a stupid example. But you get what I mean, right? Um, and then, and this is the kicker, you have a hypermedia format to represent resources. Not just XML, a specific kind of XML or a specific kind of JSON. Text HTML is not a generic format, it's a specific format with attached semantics for the purpose of displaying, of, for the purpose of describing a document to be rendered by a web browser, right? That's for human interactions. We want to look at machine interactions. And machines also need links to navigate through a service, so they know what's next. So you don't need to document some, and hard code, oh, after this operation, I can do that operation. The server should be able to tell this to the client, and the client just follows it. So, one important consequence of this, the URL identifies a resource, but the, um, the web page, for instance, sitting at a resource uh, at, a, at a location is not a resource, it's just one of the representations, right? So if we have um, the products, uh, the list of products, we can say, give me this as application JSON, and it returns us this, and we can, return, uh, we can fetch it as application XML, and we get XML back, right, so through the accept header. This is called content negotiation, and it's essential. Application XML and application JSON are generic media types. They carry no attached semantic meaning, which means you can never build a proper RESTful API, um, an API that interoperates, an API that evolves with just this media type. You need to invent another name for it. We'll get to this later, but keep this in mind. If you use application XML in your content type, it's wrong, because XML is just stuff, right? But what does name mean, and what does price mean, and what is the semantics of the currency tag? And if everyone uses application JSON, and a client receives a resource with an attached media type, it doesn't know how to interpret it without knowing more in more detail what, where, the, where it can resolve a defined meaning for the elements. So, no hypermedia format yet in these two examples. Um, and, of course, HTML, and that is a hypermedia type, a special one, um, is also possible, right? So we fetch the same list of resources, and we, in this case, we're a web browser, so we get the list of products. And there's a link, and a human can click the link and follows the link, and we want that for machines. So, first part. Proper URL design, because this is important to think in terms of resources. Bad URLs look like this, right? You have, I'm not sure if this filters by categories or actual cats. <laughs> <laughs> See, and then you have, Products, the, the product one, two, three, four, and this is probably the photos of the product. Well, I don't know. And then you have a new, and then this is, well. So, so, so better is, I like plurals for collections because you don't, na you know, you don't name your folder on your hard drive photo because there's just one photo in it. Um, you name it photos because it's a collection of photos, right? So you have a list of products, and then you use the query string to filter it. You use the query string. You don't attach stuff to the URL because that doesn't work. If you, in this URL, if you want to add more arguments, it quickly becomes ambiguous if you want to leave any of them out. And it's really hard for a client to construct a proper URL. With a query string, it's easy, and this is what a query string is supposed to be for. You have a URL, you can retrieve it, and if you want to modify the way you do retrieve it, use a query string. You have a product, it has a collection of photos, and um, you can again sort this, for instance, right? And then you can address a single photo. The fun part is that once you implement a properly RESTful service, what the URLs look like doesn't matter anymore. So you can have the bad URLs once you implement proper hypermedia. But un up until then, try to keep them clean because it helps, it helps to get your brain into this 
URL, URI mode, like representing resources and how to address them properly and how they are, what the logical hierarchy of what you want to represent is. Now, the next level is, of course, CRUD. We want to do operations. Right now, we have a bunch of URLs and we probably want to get them. But what if we want, actually want to do something with them? So on a collection, we can, of course, get the collection, right? And that gives us a list of products. And then we can post, and the post makes a new product. The server determines the URL of the new product, and it returns a 201 created, and it returns a location header. And there it is. It does not return a 200 OK, a JSON fragment with an ID, and then the client needs to know, ah, that ID I need to append to slash product slash, and then I can fetch the newly created resource. Because one day, the server might decide, ah, maybe, you know, I give the product a completely different URL, and then the client is broken. And you see, this is, once you program a client like this, is actually less code to do because you just say, fetch the location header and follow it. And it doesn't break anymore. It's following links. Ultimately, a, a good hypermedia client that uses a RESTful service is mostly a state machine that just you know, follows links according to predefined rules. And on an individual item, the product we have just retrieved, um, we can do a get to retrieve it, and we can put to update it. So we fetch the whole product, modify the description, and put the whole product back. We don't put just one field back, because then the product would consist of this one field. Right? You need to modify resources through their complete representations. If you want to do it differently, if you want to say, but I want to update only the description, then insert a link in the, in the product representation, say, this is the link to the description, it has a separate URL, like slash one, two, three, four, slash description. And then you could put to only the description, which maybe just returns text plain, right? It could, for instance. So it's no problem to make parts of a resource that are logically not separate, addressable separately. That's fine if you want to do that for efficiency. That's totally cool. And you can delete it, right? And that's simple. It's one URL, boom. The important thing is just, don't let it maintain any client state for you, the server, right? Don't expect the client to send along, oh, you know, you know, the client, ah, it's authenticated as this user, and this user has currently has this and this in his, in his shopping cart. So, so under slash cart, I display this to that user. If that user logs in twice from two browsers, stuff breaks, right? With the authentication details. If you bind it to a cookie, the client needs to send the cookie along all the time. Cookies are really just a hack for lazy developers in the early days of the web, and are just a hack for the ugliness of these login forms from basic authentication. You know when you go to a basic auth service and this pop-up comes down and says a username and password for basic auth? Everyone knows what I'm talking about? Right? And it has no remember password often enough. It doesn't have why. And also, why is there no logout button? It's been huh, 15 years, no, 20 years of browsers, and there's still no logout button for these things. I got to close all my tabs, really? This is frustrating. And that's why we have to, this is why we use login forms with cookies. We wouldn't need that. We could just say, hey, you're authenticated because, you know, the login box you want to show me has a way of saying, I can be styled, and I can have a forgot password link and a sign up link, because that's also important. And there is a logout button in the browser UI. That would be fantastic. Unfortunately, it's not the case still. I don't know why. So once we do all this, right? This is uh, level two in Bob Richardson's maturity model, um, which means we use the HTTP verbs, get, post, put, and delete. And we use status codes to indicate success. For instance, we could say, hey, wait, uh, the price you defined is too low, right? Products in that category cannot have a price lower than that and that. So you return a 409 conflict, for instance, in that case, to communicate this condition to the client. And you will soon find that all the verbs, get, post, put, delete, and there is also a patch, maybe, that's sometimes useful. Um, uh, but not in the HTTP spec, it's a separate specification. And that all the verbs, uh, sorry, all the status codes, 409, 410, 404, 405, all of these are enough to express pretty much every condition in a web application. You don't need to come up with your own usually. Who has used Twitter's API? Cool. 
Um, I'm going to rush through this a little bit because then we have uh, more time for other stuff. Um, I, wanna, I don't want to take a look at its restfulness. I just want to take a look at how well is it actually using HTTP. And the answer, unfortunately, is not at all um, because it's a terrible API. So you have a status as show, which is um, status as show. I don't know why that's in the URL. And then you have uh, an ID, which is the user ID. This is uh, in italics. It's like I, maybe I should. See, I've given this talk a bunch of times, and every time I say, sorry, this, maybe I should actually fix it. So problems with this is it says show here, right? And then you have, like, you'd, you'd have, um, give me a Twitter nickname, username. Typo3. You have show typo3.json, right? Why is it not typo3 slash show.json instead? That's weird, right? And uh, much better would be, Twitter sta Twitter.com status is ID, and in the accept header, I say, I want this and this uh, version of the URL also, which is something we're going to get to later. And also, I would say the format, JSON or XML, I send in the accept header, because this points to a status. Oh, sorry. This is actually an ID as a number numeric ID. So it's a Twitter update. Um, why do I have 5134.json and .xml? It's the same resource. It's just different representations of it, right? So it should be the same URL. And then I have an accept header where I send, give me this as XML or give, give me this as JSON. And then I can update a status. What does it do? What does update status do? Who can tell me? Change a status? No. It posts a new one. Good, huh? Update status. So they took their end user language and used it for something technical, which is often not a good idea. So um, you say update.json and you post to it. Can anyone tell me the most important thing missing in this URL? Which user? Yep, exactly. So update is in the URL again, which is totally redundant because post means creating something new, right? And it uses the authenticated user implicitly, which is so funny because Twitter themselves, in-house, they have a feature where multiple users can actually post to the same Twitter account. They've used this at some point for their own Twitter or for their support um, user, right? But this API can never do it because the URL is like this. It doesn't, con it, it doesn't post to the statuses of a user. If this was statuses, or sorry, if this was twitter.com slash one slash typo three slash statuses, and you could post to it, then initially they would only allow the user typo three to post to it. And whenever they roll out this delegation of writing permission feature, they, then the typo three user could give other people access and they authenticate, but they write to the statuses collection of the typo three user to create a new status, right? Well, that's a dead end road for Twitter. So that doesn't, that doesn't work. And users, right? And the ID would be the user ID. Maybe I should actually replace this with proper examples. Um, you can destroy a tweet again, right? Um, same, same problem. Oh, it allows post and delete, which is um, probably for XML HTTP requests because they didn't know you can define your own method there as well. Um, Retweets, right, is a collection of retweets. It's, again, not a tweet ID and then the retweets of that. It's the other way around, which is kind of odd. Um, and then you can create a retweet. And what would be the correct way of creating a retweet? F for a, this, this status, create a new retweet. Post to this URL, right? No, 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 we invent a new URL. It's called retweet. And then you, yeah. See, this is RPC, basically. So that's the summary. The angry German summary is it sucks. Um, and now real quick for like this, this will take a minute before we go to the exciting hypermedia part. Um, you, know, you guys know the World Wide Web, right? You've heard of it. <laughs> See, the World Wide Web is actually a very, very exciting thing from a purely technical perspective. Because the World Wide Web is the first data exchange system that grew 
to span an entire planet. It's, it's the biggest system of its kind because it's used for information storage and retrieval and exchange. I mean, sure, there's email, but if someone sends out some information and he doesn't send it to me, I can't get it anymore. I need to call someone, you know, with a phone and say, hey, can you forward me that URL? And then he's like, yeah, what's your email address? So why is the web so successful? The web is so successful because it uses hyperlinks. I can link to someone and he doesn't even have to link back. That was one of the very, very first ideas in the World Wide Web, that is every link that points somewhere needs to have an inverse. I mean, imagine how ridiculous that is. I want to link to google.com, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they got rid of that before they, before they, before they published it, before they uh, put it into action. So the web has no tight coupling. Right? There is no notification infrastructure. If Benjamin point, like, links to agavi.org and I say, I hate Agavi, it's a stupid framework, I'm going to delete everything. It's not true. Don't quote me on this, okay? <laughs> and if I take down that website, his link, well, it, it, it points to my server, and if my server is still up, he maybe gets a 404. If the server is not up, well, then the user gets an error message in his browser, right? But there is no notification mechanism that I have to say, oh, I know these and these folks point to me, so I have to... Uh, I have to notify them to take, to take down their links. And I can't actually switch off my website before everyone, you know, until everyone has removed their links. There is no tight coupling that limits scalability. Right? Whether you have one or 10 or a million servers, on a purely technical level, it works. On, on, on the level of information architecture, it's a bit more difficult. That's why we have search, search engines today. Right? I mean, I started using the web in 1990. Seven, I think, when Yahoo was still a manually maintained index of things, like you would go there and then it has this directory and you click links and there's five pages per topic and they all have these construction banners and animated backgrounds and stuff. Pretty cool. And then I built my own website with under construction banners and animated backgrounds. And then I was as cool as the others. <laughs> so, so, right? so, so a, link can, a link can fail. Something can break, and that's fine. The, the web fundamentally embraces failure, and that's what make, made it so success, successful. It's loosely coupled by design. You have a 404 not found, and that tells you that's gone. And maybe some other links still work, right? And these links are used to navigate the web, and um, adding information doesn't increase friction. The cool thing, of course, is that we as humans interpret the links and also changes in the links and changes in flows. If Amazon decided one day to say, hey, we'll show you a shipping cost selector before you need to sign in, then we'd probably be happy, but we can also adapt to this. Right? A machine is confused. He's like, wait, I have to log in here. Why, why is there an, like an order summary already? I didn't log in. Beep, beep, does not compute, and then it fails, right? And they have an error log entry. And they get a call in the middle of the night. It's like, ugh. Right? So adding, adding information doesn't increase friction, as we said, other than finding it. So the World Wide Web is, has become the biggest application on the web because it's protocol-centric. It has a well-understood protocol that's well-engineered and specific enough in the areas where it matters and loose enough in the areas where it doesn't matter to help it grow. If a website changes, nobody has to get a call. Not 50 API clients have to, you know, imagine like Google updates the front page and every web browser vendor needs to roll out a new version. <laughs> like at, f at 4 p.m. Pacific time on November 2nd, right? And that brings us to volume two. We have um, 17 minutes left. That should be enough. We talked about the uniform interface earlier, right? Do you guys remember? Well, we said we identify through the resources, and um, the representations are conceptually separate. Um, we manipulate these resources through representations, usually. There is exceptions. The best exception that we can come up with is a web form. You know, when you edit a product, you don't actually, it doesn't actually put uh, um, form uh, the HTML page back to the server, it 
the form is submitted. So forms as a way of transmitting information on the web, it's normal HTML forms for machines, you can use X forms um, are the exception and often used as well. And the messages is, um, contain all the information for clients to understand them and also send them back in newer versions. And the, the navigating links part and the hypermedia format part, that's called hypermedia as the engine of application state. And that is the awesome sauce ingredient, right, to REST. That's what makes REST restful. Because if we, if we have a resource, how do we know what to do with this representation? Like, what is the next operation? Even in a list of search results, you get 1,000 search results, 20 per page. How do you go to the next page? Right? How does a machine go to the next page? What are the URLs for creating a new subordinate resource? Where's the, where's the whole contract for this thing? Okay? And that is what this thing solves, pretty much. <clears throat> because the idea is that you use links, and the clients discover locations and operations, based on so-called link relations, um, that are used to express the options. So a link relation, you retrieve a product, and it has a link rel equals category, and then an href. And then the client knows, ah, oh, that's, a, that's a category. And then you could theoretically add more categories and nothing breaks, right? I mean, old clients maybe just understand one category, so they take the first one and that's it. Um, and the clients don't need to know the URLs. So at some point I can point to Amazon's categories if I want. And, you know, if Amazon sends the same expected media format that I also used, that's of course the condition. I have an example for this later. Um, and that abstracts the entire application workflow, right? Makes it much more manageable. And we can also version the media type itself. So if we say, okay, there is a break now that we must do, then we can say, okay, that's a new version of the API, and we do that through the media type, not through the URL. I'm gonna tell, talk about why the URL versioning is bad in a moment. And ideally, that means the clients don't break if I update implementations. Because usually I add a few links, I add a few elements at adding new information, but clients, if they worked so far, chances are they will continue working. Because if you say, wait, I have a new element and clients absolutely must interpret it, then it's very likely that your problem domain changed. You know, you stopped selling cars, you now offer scuba diving courses, and that's a totally different problem domain maybe. <coughs> So XHTML and Atom are hypermedia formats. Um, Atom is a bit too generic for my taste. XHTML is always a special case because it doesn't attach semantic meaning from the problem domain of the document to the document. It attaches semantic meaning such as this is a list item and this is a paragraph, and the person interpreting it is, uh, sorry, the item, or the, 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 the actor interpreting it is the user agent rendering it into a representation where then the final interactions are driven by a user by clicking, right? I click check out on Amazon's shopping cart. Um, but we can also roll our own, which is um, a, a very preferable way of doing things. Um, we can invent our own media type, right? Uh, com.acme.shop.xml. So if you have v and d dot, then you can make up your own stuff. It's like in the, in the mime type spec. And we say this is based on XML. You know how XHTML is application slash XHTML plus XML to indicate that it's based on the XML, on the application XML media type. Um, and we get this back, okay? And we're reusing an atom element in this case for link relations because I'm lazy, right? So I don't have to redefine the meaning of the rel and the type and the href attribute. Um, and um, the meaning of payment is actually defined. This is a terrible example, usually, because payment still requires some knowledge. But imagine this was link rel next, for instance, or home or index. Something defined in this link relation list. Just Google this, and you'll find it. Um, if whatever meaning you have, for instance, a category or a tag or a photo gallery, that's not defined in this list, then you make up your own rel name, but you use a full URL for it. You don't just use this because it colli could collide with something. So similar to, to namespa XML namespaces, for instance, you just use a domain you control and a full, fully qualified name. And then a client, if it wants to go to the payment operation, it fetches this resource and follows this link. So it says, look for the link element with the rel payment and fetch the href, it's here, <laughs> sorry, and follow this. 
you could have two of these. You could have one payment for the Acme Corp Shop plus XML and another for um, plus JSON, for instance, if you have a JSON variant. Or a, or a type text HTML and then the iPhone client that allows me to buy this red stapler, right? It, it could have a button open in Safari and then it follows the link for text HTML but with the same rel. Um, and here we also, this is, you know, to help clients, this is mostly for programmers, help for programmers, or so machines can dynamically decide, ah, I'm allowed to put or delete this resource because I'm logged in as an administrator right now, so I didn't send authentication headers here um, in the requests, but just imagine I, I did, then it tells me, hey, you can put and delete to this as well, which is also very cool for learning. Because usually, if you want to learn as a programmer a new, uh, such an interface, what you need is two things. You need the start URL, where the, where the, where the root of the service is, and you need a documentation for, that, for the XML or the JSON format used and what every element means, and that's it. What the interactions and the possible steps are, you can find out by just fetching stuff. And that is Richardson's maturity level level three. Because we have links, we can follow them, and now we have a truly RESTful web service. XML is really good for that because it has, you know, pretty fine standards, full linking and all this stuff that you can easily reuse. It has namespaces, it has attributes. So you have a price tag and you can simply add a currency attribute to it without breaking the structure of the document. And JSON is more difficult because it doesn't have all this stuff, right? And it's actually not a lot more readable in my opinion. Another problem with, um, with these two is that in order to interpret this, you must buffer it fully. This you can r theoretically use, um, consume with a streaming XML parser, which for mobile devices is very important. If you have 100 megabytes of response data, you can, you, you can consume it with constant memory usage in, a, in, a, in an XML version. And you can actually, you know, you can say, ah, okay, so the, the content type that the server returned is something I understand. Now I look at the root tag of the response because it's XML. I look at the namespace. Oh, yeah, that's a product, so we're safe. So I can co continue. If not, I error out, which is very convenient. With JSON, you need to load everything first because, before you can make sense of it. And the other problem with JSON is you can't evolve it, right? JSON has no mixed content, which is most important for HTML, right? This is not possible. And then you have a, another, a second price tag. This would never work in JSON. In JSON, you have price and it's a float 599. If you want to make the pr con add another second price, the price that was a float all of a sudden turns into an array of objects, each having a currency and an amount key. That breaks every client out, that guaranteed. So you need to have a prices array, and then your API really quickly becomes very, very ugly. So at quickly adding stuff, you know, this a client can still look for a price element. It doesn't have to understand the currency tag, theoretically. Or this stuff, right? XML lang, it's built into the language definitions. You can say German and English title for the, for the thing. And linking. And, you know, if you don't have this hypermedia part, then you don't have a RESTful API. And that is not a problem. Okay? So don't feel bad. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of upfront work that only pays off much later. And <clears throat> sometimes it's the only way to do it. Good examples are CouchDB, because the CouchDB server does not understand the semantic meaning of your documents. You just post a J JSON key and keys and values. You can build your own RESTful hypermedia API with CouchDB as an application in CouchDB, but the, the interface for fetching and uh, storing documents knows nothing about the structure. So it's just application JSON. And S3 is the same thing. Amazon S3 does not understand the text file, the video, the image you're putting to it, okay? Just don't call it a REST API, ideally. That makes me happy. That would make me happy. Um, here's another last example I want to give. Who, who knows LoveFilm? It's, this, it's the DVD rental service that Amazon bought a while ago. And he, this is a search result. And this is exciting stuff because it demos very, very well what REST is about. Uh, what hypermedia is about and the, and the hate, hate OS part. Here we have a link to self. So this is the page we're currently on because maybe we got redirected a bunch of times and the client doesn't have to take, keep track of it even. 
It just, from the current document, it can figure out what the location for it is. And see, we have two items per page. I actually cut off the, the other one. And there's a start index three, which is the next page, and the last possible page is start index five. So a client who wants to, con who wants to load all the search results for a search to its local database is a while loop following the next link until there is no more next link. And then you're done. There is no interpreting the result count and the current result pointer keys from the SOAP response and knowing that while there is still one, you can call the method again, right? And here you have a link to the synopsis and here you have a link to the reviews. And here you can see the rel is a URI because there is no predefined reviews thing that the IANA, the IANA um, defined. So you make up your own under your own URI so you don't break other people's stuff. And the cool thing is that next week they could decide, you know, Amazon bought us, Amazon have much cooler reviews than we do for all the stuff, so this URL will point to Amazon's service and they deliver our, our custom media type. And then no client would break because it just follows a link, right? There's room for improvement in this API. Um, it uses application XML, which is a problem because imagine they want to add a second reviews link to Amazon's real review XML flavor, right? Then you have two links. Then you need to give it a type attribute. And if both are application XML, then a client can't decide, oh, that's the Amazon one and that's the LoveFilm one and they're different, right? It would have to know that. So that's why you have to have your own media type um, because it's, it allows interoperability. So they, once they have their own media type, they should add le also rel attributes. They should use an XML namespace, I think. It's better for versioning, for you know, reusing element declarations, et cetera. And um, yeah, that would be nice. But overall, it's a pretty good thing. Um, one more thing is uh, hosts and versioning. Um, why, uh, why don't I like api.twitter.com? Because I, in my a examples, I just use twitter.com. The problem is that technically api.twitter.com and twitter.com are separate resources. Um, I can understand why Twitter does it because they probably use DNS round robin for it and different you know, setups for their web interface and for their API. Um, the other more important part is that you should not use something like slash one and slash two in your, in, in your URLs. Um, use, it, use the media type. Ideally use something like this, com twitter api.v1 you can leave the V1 out in the, in, the, in the first version, and in the second version you add a V2, right? That's fine. Some people do it with a semicolon, but, uh, you know, you're not, you can't be quite sure if every implementation interprets that correctly or maybe cuts it off because it thinks it's one of these Q quality indicators in an accept header and stuff, so it probably just causes trouble, so, so go that way. And there's also another really important um, reason why you shouldn't be using slash one and slash two in the URLs. Imagine type 03 or imagine PHPBB shipped an API for every installation. How do you even know the host name? It's on someone's server, right? And there is their, their URL. So um, the problem is then that clients would have to regex the URL. And what if it's not always in the root of the, of the installation, right? So this is the sharksforum.org where sharks talk about the best laser beams for their heads. And uh, the, you could have this, or you could have this, so you'd have to know, ah, oh, wait, there's a community API v1, or maybe there's a, just an API v1, and I need to you know, have a regex for this to know that this is, ah, this is version one of the protocol. That sucks. And what if, um, what if a, comp a competitor to PHPBB wants to implement the same API PHPBB has? So all the iPhone clients work with that form as well. They could do that, right? That would be fantastic. That's what the web is about, interoperability. But it wouldn't be possible because they would also have to use slash v1 and slash v2 in their URLs, and that's not the point. So media, media type versioning because URL versioning kills interoperability. Now, you might be wondering why all this is so cool. Right? I mean, I've, sh I've shown some merits because, hey, it doesn't break and stuff. But, um, and we've, we've talked about how it's easy to evolve, right? And, uh, and lazy developers can learn it easily and, uh, and the eager developers can also learn it easily because all of them just, well, there's some documentation, but you can actually play around with it fairly easily and figure out what's going on. And, um, the, um, 
the, the API itself also scales very well with the number of features that you add. And of course, and this is the biggest, the biggest incentive for most people, is that you get all the coolness in HTTP, right? From content negotiation over TLS um, through to um, the, all the caching stuff and the conditional requests. You can say, when you make a put, right, you, you get a product, and the server can give you an e tag, which is kind of a hash of the thing. And then when you say, OK, I modify the description and I put it back. And you include a header saying, if match, and you add the URL, uh, the, the hash that the server gave you in the, in the last response. And that means update this resource with this new information I give you, but only if the, um, if the resource hasn't changed. That's optimistic locking. There is no locks on the web. This is awesome, right? That's conditional requests. But many people then say, wait, hold on a second. Like, I get all this HTTP goodness from the level two part. The level three part with the links and following it, there must be some sort of benefit to it, right? Beyond the extensibility and making sure that in five years, if we actually extend the API, stuff doesn't break. Not really. I've actually implemented, earlier this year, I've implemented a, um, a large-scale system where we had to endure a few million write operations per day, where the key to scalability, to, the key to, making, to being able to grow it was the hypermedia and the following links. But in most cases, it's really just about the extensibility. And Roy himself says this, right? That it's for, for software design on, the, on, 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 the, on, on a scale of decades. And people are really bad at short-term efficiency, so they usually screw their APIs up. And um, also, this is another important thing. Most developers simply don't care what happens to their products years after it's been after it is deployed, because most people say, "Why would I make it properly hypermedia thingy?" Right? I'm, I'll be in another job by the time that shit hits the fan. So, if you uh, if you want to read up a little bit more on this, um, there's an excellent article. As the, like that was my first introduction, I think, to the whole thing. How I explained rest to my wife, which is an actual conversation that happened in someone's bedroom. Um, how to get a cup of coffee models the Starbucks ordering flow um, this way. And um, you can also read Roy Fielding's thesis and try not to fall asleep like I always do um, when reading theses. And um, there's a bunch of cool books on REST. These two have a few, like for instance, Subu recommends using URI for, for versioning. I've actually been able to talk to him about this in August and he says, don't use your eyes for versioning, but it's in his book now, so <laughs> that's not good. This is the best one. If you want a good introduction to this, because it starts out with the problems of the level zero plain old XML over the wire, and it show quickly shows the merits of this whole hypermedia part by implementing the Starbucks flow. So it's a rest box implementation that you have at the end, which is very cool because the rest box demo is used in many, many places. And that will be the end of my talk. If you have any questions, you can ask them for another minute, I think. And um, in the meantime, I'd like to thank you already. But no, let's ask the questions first. Well, yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah. First, thank you a lot. That was awesome. Uh, I have two little questions. Uh, first one, um, currently the kind of default format for web addresses is uh, ending on HTML. Yeah. Would you prefer to get rid of that? Mm -hmm. No, that's actually important because a web browser cannot, um, by simply f clicking a link, you cannot indicate what response format you're expecting because it's a, it's a person clicking on a link. So if you have the download this listing as, uh, as an Excel sheet or as a CSV file for you know, a sales dude who needs to download this report as a CSV, he needs a products.csv or something or a sales.csv URL so his browser can address it somehow. So that's fine, right? But for an API, you should avoid it because you have machines driving the interaction. The machine can decide what it wants and it can send the appropriate accept header. So this is the dot something extension is one of the cases where you make the compromise for the edge case where users are involved and browsers are involved. There's a lot of edge cases for browsers. Browsers don't support put and delete, for instance. It was even dropped from the HTML5 spec because they couldn't see the merits. 
because they're idiots. <laughs> and everyone told them, and they were not listening. That was frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, it's, it's, that's a massively frustrating thing, because we could unify so much more on the machine and the human APIs if our XML HTTP requests right now are already able to make put and delete requests. But if a form could, could send a delete request, that would be fantastic. All right, thanks. Uh, and the other one, you, you said it's perfectly fine to have uh, an URI for a sub-part of a resource. Uh, yes. Is that true for the other way around? So I have uh, um, uh, nested resources, and I want to edit them in kind of one form. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Or would you have to create a, an own resource for that? This is, that, is, um, that is a classical problem of API design. It's not restricted to REST. I mean, you have this problem in SOAP as well. I want to get a list of products. Does, does every product object actually contain the category object, or does it co just contain the category ID, and do I need to call get category with this ID? This is a classical problem that REST doesn't solve. It's a trade-off you need to make pretty much for every specific situation where you say, okay, I want, I want, um, I want to waste bandwidth here for the sake of uh, um, request efficiency or the other way around. Some people even, sa even have query arguments um, saying query string expand equals true or something, and then it expands the inline objects. You could do that. Yeah, but you could, you could make collections. You could even, if you want to make a bulk operation, you could say, you could post a list of IDs to a bulk operation thing that returns then the collection of these objects, and then you can edit them in one go, for instance. That's how you usually do bulk operations. Um, so also, thank you very much from my side. Um, just a question regarding the, um, the schema types you had in the link, this rel yeah. attribute values, the IANA schema, schema types. Mm -hmm. When you define your own ones using URLs, I think it's, that's great, and that's also very much in line with your, all the semantic web ideas. Yeah. But is there some standard or some, should, should this URL actually be dereferenceable and contain some machine-readable way no. of the schema? No, no, usually not. It's because... What the, what the meaning of the link relation is, is in, in the documentation of the media type. So the, document, the media type do, do says, um, here is seven XML schemas for the seven different resource types in this media type, and you can expect these link relations. And this is, once again, one of the many, many examples where XML just comes in handy, because you could have the link element across all the different resource types, which have in different namespaces, but the link element is in one namespace. And then you also have a tag element always from the same namespace. And then when you, when you build a client that has to interpret this, it sees an element from a namespace and it defers the handling to the handler for that namespace. And you, it just cuts down on coding after a while uh, compared to JSON. JSON is, JSON I would use mostly um, for when you know that there is a way for the client, when you don't have to break the clients, which you usually don't know in advance, or when you have control over the clients. If your client is just your own web interface, please use JSON. I would not handle uh, XML in the browser in JavaScript, because that's a pain in the ass. But it's just you who has to do this, right? But other people who rely on your stuff never breaking, even in five years down the road, offer them the option of XML. It's going to make you and them happy. Not immediately. It's an upfront investment. It pays off after a while. More questions? I think we have to. No, it's lunchtime, right? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs>